Hello, ballers! What's going on? It's Preacher, and today we're going to continue our melee series by being a useful melee. There's a lot of um, superstitions and sort of urban legends that fly around WoW, and one of them in particular is people don't like having a lot of melee, right? When the reality is, over the course of a game that's lasted over a decade, there are a handful, and I mean a handful, of situations where the very, very cream of the top-end guilds didn't take melee. It's such a tiny, minute portion. I'm talking of the very, very top-end guilds. When it came to even when I was doing, like, World 10th with some guilds, we took a nice, balanced amount of melee and range to those encounters, and we did just fine. We got them done. We didn't do them day one, but we got them in, like, week three or something like that. It's a very old superstition, but it's a wonderful excuse that a lot of people use as to why they can't get anywhere. Right? Why they can't get things done. I'm a melee and people don't want melee. So what we're going to look at today is how you actually do things as a melee that makes you very, very desired. Yeah? Very, very, very desired by players. And a good anecdote here that I want you to bear in mind is once you start playing with regular people because you're going to be playing better and people will be like, I kind of want to play with this guy again. What actually happens once you start doing things like a lot of Mythic Plus and you're doing them with the same kind of groups, usually with a little bunch of friends that you'll start making, or friends that you've already got, is you'll actually be doing things in a very, very set way that requires no communication, but ordinarily, it would require a lot of communication because you're doing this rinse-repeat process. Now, how can you be a useful melee? Being useful melee is a lot more than just doing damage. I imagine there's a huge quantity of the WoW population that believes, well, if you just do mega deeps, you're going to be fine. Uh, for, yeah, for the most part, in some, some groups, sure. But there's always those players, and believe me, if you've not met one, you will do once you get into raiding, who, if everything goes right, they'll do awesome damage. They'll do absolutely awesome damage. However... If there's anything slightly out of the ordinary, they're fucked. They're absolutely doomed. There's no way they're going to be survived. And they're kind of like the jokesters of the guild. <laughs> they're, they're, they're good guys for the most part. I'm not uh, saying that the people behind the mouse and keyboard are dickheads or anything. I'm just saying you'll know those guys. If they can be left alone to just sort of do their thing, they'll be totally fine. And they'll probably rock your damage meter as well. They'll probably way up there, if not number one. But if they do have to deal with some situations... No, it's not going to happen. So what I want you guys to be able to do is not only rock the DPS, uh, but also be this useful member of the crew who's like, I want this guy anyway. And, it, and you'll actually find that as your guild gets better, in the worst guilds, this doesn't really pay off, unfortunately, and that's kind of sad because raid leaders are still probably getting to grips with what's really needed in a, in a proper group, is that if you have a guy who you know and can guarantee is going to do the mechanics and not wipe you, you will take them over the guy who might do more damage, right? I want you to understand that. Good raid leaders will be like, I can trust this guy to get this job done, and therefore I want him over the guy who may or may not do way more damage, but will probably fuck us at some point, or will screw us up, or will do something that's going to make this fight harder, right? So that's what you need to bear in mind here. What's really cool about this is I can actually show you a lot of ways that we become a much more useful member of the group as a melee uh, in literally the first two minutes of the Eye of Ashara Heroic. Yeah. When you watch streams of guys, or maybe you watch streams of me, or whether you watch videos of whoever it might be, and they're playing a melee, often it's so clusterfucked with information that's going on that if they're doing cool stuff, you're likely not to even notice it's going on as a casual viewer. Uh, similar to how a lot of people watch boss kill videos, and it looks kind of easy, and they walk away saying, that fight looks really, really easy, despite it might have taken a guild, you know, 300 attempts to get there. Um, you'll miss out on all these little intricacies. It's also why you can't really get a good boss strategy from watching boss kill videos. You can kind of see what the raid's doing if it's doing like positions and stuff, but all the individual assignments and the small things that have been picked up along those 300 wipes, you're not really going to be able to pick those out. So as we go into the Eye of Ashara here, this is the kind of mentality I want to instill into you, okay? I think this is very important that you understand all the little things that are going on here because you'll start to be able to apply this from every single encounter you ever do. Once we get into the Eye of the first thing that generally happens is we move over to the left and we're going to get ready to move down this left-hand side and move towards the boss. This is going to skip a lot of trash that's down the central pathway, right? Now, I would imagine every single one of you listening to this who've ever done the Eye of will in fact know this process. However, what's the thought process that's going through your mind here? 
What's the thought process? As we look at our first two mobs, we have a caster and we have a melee. Now, what traditionally would happen is that we're going to pull these and we're going to move on to the next pack, which is a, a mirror of this pack. And then probably you're going to pull the giant um, fish guy, whatever the fuck he's supposed to be, into it to create a ball of five mobs. That's a pretty standard pull for heroics and early mythics, right? You're not going to push it too much beyond there. Usually tanks are quite comfortable with that pack. They know they can survive it and you can deal with it with randoms. Now as a melee... We're going to make that much better because we have to use what our advantages are. The main advantage of being a melee is our mobility. The fact that we can do lots and lots of things while constantly being in motion. This is something that barely any caster can do. This is where we start to shine. Casters need to stand still and cast things for the most part. Lots of them could do cool things while they're moving, but you can essentially maintain full DPS while maintaining motion. So we're going to make decisions based on what our class can do here. So you can apply this to any melee class. Most of them have pretty similar abilities. So my Fury Warrior, I pack things like Interrupts, of course, that we talked about in the last video. We're going to be using that in a second. Uh, AoE Stun in the form of Shockwave. And I have Fear, which I will rarely ever use, ever, ever, ever. Uh, and I also have Commanding Shout to increase the HP of the group. Those are my utilities. Those are the things that I bring to the group. I also have Taunt. I'm going to talk about that at the end of the video. So as a useful melee, I've already got a full-on plan of how I'm going to help this group do our initial objective. And the first thing I'm going to think about is, where is this first caster mob? I don't trust the tank to interrupt it, right? I don't do that. And you shouldn't either, especially if you're in a random group. So this could be a random Mythic Plus, it could be a random Heroic, whatever it might be. I don't trust the caster to do this. We know from the last video, good methods of interrupting, but we're going to apply it in a different way here. We know from experience, that this caster storm mob doesn't have a huge arsenal of spells. And if I interrupt something, he's got to move. So this is a concept not a lot of people are familiar with. Is if you interrupt a mob and it is not got a huge array of spells that are going to chain back to back, it's going to try and melee something. Now, it's usually going to have aggro, aggro on the tank. That means that if you interrupt it, it's going to try and get to the tank. It's going to reposition itself so it can melee the tank because you stopped it casting spells right i hope everybody understands that because it's a very important piece of overall world of warcraft information so i've got a plan here i'm going to make sure <laughs> that we charge down to here and i'm going to watch what the tank does and if the tank continues going and doesn't interrupt it i'm going to interrupt this storm weaver and i'm going to bring it over to the next mobs What's this going to do? This is going to create a much better death ball that we can help the tank do. And it's going to allow us to kill everything much more efficiently. Again, this isn't about doing raw mad deeps. This is about utility. So as we move over, we can see we charge there. Assessing what the tank's doing, not much. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to chill out. And I'm going to interrupt the AoE instead. Right? But if we were going to continue moving, I would have interrupted the very first spell as soon as possible. So the last video, we talked about being able to interrupt at the very, very end of the cast to maximize downtime on mobs. But we're going to apply that now to do it very, very quickly so we can actually move the mobs as fast as humanly possible and get the death ball created. Because we're after mad AoE in here. We're after mad deeps. This is a heroic. And it'll be the same in early Mythic Pluses depending on your gear. So it turns out the tank was actually talking to me because <laughs> he knew who I was, uh, which is very, very cool. So as we moved on through the dungeon... What you'll notice is we go to the next pack, but this time, after the tank's finished talking to me, he moves down to the large fish bro. What that means is we reenact our plan from the beginning, which is going to leave uh, with, him, with him not interrupting the Stormweaver. This one's going to remain in position. And now many of you, many of you can probably relate to this, is that you'll be doing Ivashara, you'll be down attacking all the mobs, but the lower ledge, and there's a fucking Storm bro on his own, on the cliff, just casting freely. We're going to prevent that happening because we have constant motion and we can prevent that happening. So all I do is hang back for a second, interrupt it and bring it down with us and then get into the next group and continue onwards. And what you're going to notice is, oh, look, all the mobs are together, free and able to be cleaned. Now, and now we're down involving oracles. OK, like I said, there's lots of stuff going on in this Ivashara that I am doing as a melee. The only I can really do as a melee, because the casters generally aren't going to be able to do any effective DPS if they don't, if they like try and do this. You'll notice the Moonkin is having a whale of a time just AoEing. Uh, but because I can do this, 
this is where I'm going to shine. And people are going to be like, and maybe not even notice it. Again, as always with these videos, people might not ever notice that you're doing it, but you should be doing it because you're going to have a better run regardless. It doesn't matter if people know why they had a better run. All they know is they had a better run. So as we've included the Oracle, this has a heal. But I just interrupted. We're going to bring in that utility. Just because I have interrupts on cooldown does not mean I can't help it. I'm going to see a heal being cast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop back and I'm just going to stun it down. But I'm also going to try and stun more than one mob, if possible. I couldn't get the stun on it, but we're going to try that. So you might your, thir your first thought process is probably, well, I'd know to stun that. If, it, if my interrupts on cooldown, but I had stun, I'd know to do that, Preach, that's no big deal. What you're going to notice is that little shift of position to try and stun more things. <laughs> try and maximize this utility, locking the, bo locking the mobs down to make things so much easier for the rest of the group, okay? Very, very simple process that we can do. We then hang back even four, even more, finish off these mobs with our execute. What we don't do at that point is interrupt. As I talked about in the second one, is interrupting is something you need to know when to do it and when to not do it. These mobs are about to die, and we're about to go into another pack again through experience. We know this is going to happen that has a healer in it. So we're going to use that knowledge. Do I want to put myself on an interrupt cooldown for the sake of racking up more interrupts on the fucking meters? Or do I want to use it on something worthwhile and then my groups barely get any heals off? There's a big difference there. You can go and flash your Skada or whatever it is with a shitload of interrupts, but what the fuck are you interrupting? Again, trying to control the group. So we move down into this group. We're going to target the Oracle because he's the healer and that's our priority. Range tends to not to prioritize in that way. Range tends to not think about all these extra utilities they have. What I always do on my melee, and you'll see it throughout these runs, is I position myself in such a way that if I have to use my stun, my shockwave, I'm going to hit as many mobs as possible. And I'm going to prioritize mobs specifically that are going to do things like heals. Because that is my job. I am the melee. This is my job. Let's all put this into action. So we're going to do that very much. Now we instantly go straight into the boss. Okay, so we're going to go balls to the wall DPS, as we always do, the best we can possibly do on our character. But that doesn't mean it's the end of our job to help everything go smoother. As a melee, we have the power of mobility. So I'm going to position myself at the side for some AoE. Notice the caster hangs outside. I'm going to throw an interrupt on it. and going to bring it back into the death ball. Again, I know it's going to go to the tank. He probably has aggro on it and gain control of this situation. On Mythic Plus, what I see happen all the time is melees gluing to the fucking boss and what they're doing is hoping and praying that the tank will deal with most situations or somebody else will and it's a really terrible attitude to have a really terrible attitude to have is just hoping and praying that somebody else deals with it or you or more importantly and i actually think this is probably more the case is people don't know that this is a problem. They don't realize what they're doing or they don't realize that they can actually help out in different ways. So from there, we're going to jump over to the Arcway Mythic and we're going to see uh, how we can be effective in a very, very fast speed run of this. This was just for the AP quest that happened to be up that day. And we're going to be running alongside people in item level 900 gear. <coughs> and that's going to be absolutely fine because I know I'm the weakest geared in here by a long way. So how am I going to make sure that I'm a useful member of the group? Well, I'm going to try and do as much damage as humanly possible. But in this speed run, where we run without a healer, right? So we're going to be doing this without a healer. Uh, my job has changed. My job is going to be as locked down and control as many mobs as possible. It's not about my damage in here. I have friends who are going to do the damage. So it's accepting your role is another part of being a decent addition to any group. Knowing what your role is. My role here is sure, it's to do damage, but realistically, with a group with zero healers, my role is going to be to help control and make sure the other guys get as much damage as humanly possible, right? That's all it's going to be. So what you're going to see regularly is me utilizing, utilizing these AoE stuns that I have in the prime situation. So let's talk about AoE stuns for a second. <clears throat> What I see with AoE stuns when I play with a lot of random guys is they essentially just use it on cooldown because they think they have to. They think it's good, solid play to get a big group of mobs and stun them down. It is not. What we want to be doing is stopping the mobs from doing what they do that's dangerous, right? Doing what they do that's dangerous. It's not really an interrupt because the power of a stun also involves the ability to stop people doing, or mobs doing physical things, not spell casts. We can lock them down in a huge number of ways. 
And the way we do that is by AoE stunning as much as possible when things are actually getting dangerous. Is the tank dropping a little bit low and might need a second to top himself up? Is this going to be chain... Are these two melee mobs going to be chain casting a couple of things? It's about knowing, again, similar to the interrupts, what's coming and how can we make our best use of our character in that situation? All these little tiny things that I've gone over over the past like 10 minutes, all these little things that I've done and just showed you within two little dungeons apply to everything. And you'll notice that all these, there's, there's so many little tiny things that you're doing constantly. You'll notice if you just look at my cooldown bars, how often these things are on cooldown and actually regenerating and maximizing their usage of them and how smoothly these runs go. How smoothly. And you might wonder to yourself, I, I wonder... How these guys are running high-end Mega Mythics without even taking healers anymore. It must just be the tanks, right? And I'm sure that's the mindset of many. It must be just a really overpowered tank. No. It's exactly what I did in the tanking videos. It's a team effort. You're all working together to make this run as smooth as possible. And that involves utilizing all the skills. Now, these runs could be done like this although this is only a mythic one for the world quest but we can do this in many mythics and we have done this in many mythics with my guys is because i'm doing all this stuff right and i'm showing you the stuff that i'm doing here every single person in this group is doing something similar they're all working to the same goal they all want to do as much damage as possible while taking the least damage possible and they all know how to do that and they all work together to get it done and if you want to be somebody who isn't left in the dirt because you're just a Fury Warrior, you're just a Windwalker Monk, you're just a replaceable DPS, which is something I don't want for any one of you. I don't want you to be somebody who can be interchangeably swapped with any other player and everything about you is dictated by an item level. If you don't want to be that, these are the things you're going to have to do. And the glorious part about being a melee is you can do this relentlessly absolutely relentlessly there are casters who can stun sure but do they want to do it absolutely not it's going to cost them somewhere else there are casters that can interrupt it's going to cost them somewhere else it's never going to cost a melee anywhere near as much ever and so you should embrace that and you should become the best you can be and hopefully that's what you're going to take away from this all right guys thank you so much for watching i'll see you again Bye bye